So I want to uh, welcome you all to the Native American Heritage Month reading and conversation today, featuring writers Gwendolyn Paradise and Rebecca Pelkey. I'm Rebecca Olander. I teach in the English department at Westfield State University, and I am also the editor and director of Perugia Press, the press that was lucky enough to publish Pelkey's second poetry collection, Through a Red Place, this fall. This year, Perugia is celebrating its 25th anniversary. We publish one book a year by an emerging woman poet, and Rebecca's book is our 25th collection. We are so pleased to gather with everyone who's listening in to mark Native American Heritage Month, and we're honored to welcome our participants today as creators with varied, varied representation of Native American heritage. I would first like to thank the writers, both writers, for sharing their work today. I want to thank my Westfield colleague and Perugia board member, Beverly Army Williams, for acting as co-host, and also the English department, um, especially uh, Emily Todd, our department chair, and Regina Smielek, um, our administrative assistant, but the whole department for supporting uh, this program and also the SAIL program, the student activities program at Westfield for sponsoring the event as well. I'd also like to thank marketing for making a beautiful poster and um, mostly every, each and every one of you for attending and listening in. It's really wonderful that you're taking part in this reading and in the conversation. We do hope that you'll take part in that after the reading. So just to give you a sense of what's happening this afternoon, um, each writer will read for about 25 minutes. And then in the last half an hour of the program, we'll have a dedicated time for Q&A. So please feel free to add questions you have to the chat as we go through the afternoon and we can look back through the chat and bring those forward when it's time for that. Um, I already asked folks as they were coming in, but if you're just joining us, if you could put where you're zooming in from in the chat, that's always really nice to see. And we can get a sense of who's in the audience. And finally, you're invited to add to the chat favorite lines that you hear or comments that you might have about the writing as you're hearing and listening, it's always, it's kind of like little Valentines that go to the writers afterward, which is nice. And it's one of the perks of Zoom. So we're not together, but that is a nice little silver lining to Zoom. So we're going to start with Gwendolyn Paradise and I will introduce them now. Gwendolyn Paradise Edward is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, identifies as two-spirited and is hard of hearing. Their first collection of short stories, more enduring for having been broken, won the 2019 Hudson Prize from Black Lawrence Press and was published in early 2020. Their co-authored chapbook, Carnival Bound or Please Unwrap Me, was an editor's choice pick from the cupboard pamphlet and was published by the press in late 2019. Gwendolyn's short fiction and essay can be found in Crab Orchard Review, Booth, Hypertext, Tin House Online, Uncanny Magazine, Craft, and others. They retain an MFA from Bennington College and a PhD from the University of Missouri. They are currently an assistant professor of fiction at Murray State University. When they're not teaching, reading, or writing, you can find them playing video games or powerlifting. So please welcome Gwendolyn paradise. Thank you, Rebecca, for that intro. Uh, and thank you too to Westfield State University's Department of English for providing this space for Becky and I to share our work and to Perugia Press for bringing me into the conversation and inviting me to read. Um, a special thank you to Becky Pelkey, who is such a generous friend and fellow writer um, and who reached out to me about this event. Today, I'm going to be reading uh, two pieces, one flash piece and one short story. And I'll contextualize them briefly before I get into them. Um, the first piece I'm going to read comes from this chapbook, Carnival Bound, which uh, is, is maybe one of my favorite things that I've ever written. It was co-written with a friend and poet, Kara Doris, who teaches at Illinois College. And Kara and I both have invisible disabilities and we also both love fairy tales. So we have this intersection in our friendship and our research where we um, look at fairy tales and how they represent disability. 
And as she and I started to deep dive into disability theory and to talk about it with each other, um, we really started to gravitate towards the concept of the freak show, which is really foundational in a lot of ways to disability theory. And we started to wonder what would happen if we invented a world where there was a freak show staffed entirely by um, disabled women. And this little book came into existence and they are flash pieces that work together. And over time, the story of the carnival kind of unfolds, but each one is like a profile of, of one of the women who works in the carnival. Um, each story in the collection has a title and a subtitle. So the one I'll be reading today is called Bear Skin, or she was the delight of insistence of forgetting. And I'll warn the readers that um, I, I am queer, I identify as two-spirited. My preferred pronouns are, are very uh, difficult to use in conversation. So the way I usually provide them to people in email and on documents is open parentheses S, close parentheses H-E and then um, her slash his. And when you try to vocalize those things, it sort of like disrupts, I think, a lot of um, people's ability to, to just stay with the reading. And so the piece I'm reading is, is important to me because I use my preferred pronouns in this flash piece, and I also read it with my preferred pronouns. So this is Bearskin. She, he was a delight or insistence of forgetting. So when she, he was first asked about before, she, he said that fairy tales are static and unchanging, that they don't look backward or forward, that to ask about before is to ask about how one comes into being and how can anyone have knowledge of their creation when they are no longer that person or animal. She, he, like shoe leather, and ring pops and whistles, in the smell of cigarette butts, rain that slants at an angle. When anyone asked about before, she, he would make up stories to pad the gaps. Before, she, he said, outside of Memphis to a little girl in a pink dress, I was a tow truck driver. And then in Charleston to the woman running her hands over her, his back, Marveling at her, his fur, she, he said, I worked at an IT help desk for an internet company. We've probably talked before. But it was in Corpus Christi that the sound of the ocean unlocked something under her, his skin, weaving a bridge between the two parts of the brain, between the before and after. And so when the man with the cane poked through the bars of the cage and asked what she, he had been before, she, he said, a man. Disco balls and licorice and popcorn kernels blackened by heat and exploded, smelling burnt. Somewhere, a false memory, perhaps, sharp brine on a swollen tongue. How many times can a person be sold before they become a beast? She, he walked the promenade, ate an orange sherbet push up, and hoped to see a mermaid. Passersby wondered if she, he was naked, but were too polite to ask. Fur covered even her, his genitals. Seagulls screeched and bombed her, his shoulders. She, he plucked one from the air and took its head. In Tucson, she, he said, before what? In Denver, the dazzling girls that could be wives or sisters or daughters or none of these found her him in a pool of Kool-Aid blood, holding her his own skin and saying, I was never a man, was I? Once she, he had been sewn back together, she, he couldn't escape before. It was like something had been unraveled inside, a snake twisting in the gut, a gate rotted off its hinges. When people began to ask her him about before, she, he growled, and snapped and once maimed a woman who didn't mean any harm. She just wanted to touch the brown matted coat. Before she, he was a man who stocked hard liquor in a pirate themed bar. 
before she, he had too much to drink that one night and careened her his car into a van of cheerleaders. Before broken and sobbing on the side of the road, the man who found her him said a short prayer, lamenting the beauty strewn across the asphalt. Before, she he had not known it was all a trap. An entire life smelted of metal, tight coils ready to snap down on any who dared to step away from it. Saw teeth rusted with age, bristling with tetanus, and the promise of veins bruised with bad blood. In Anchorage, a family of bears came to the carnival. They took pictures of overflowing trash cans, technicolor marionettes, hot dogs rotating on spits and grease dripping, congealing into milky, soft, flat fat. They spoke in tentative roars. Even when their voices were lowered, they scared the patrons. The parent bears informed the child bears about their grandmother who had once been employed or entrapped at a carnival. She'd worn a tutu and balanced on top of a ball. All of her teeth were broken by then and she'd had to drink meat smoothies for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. When she, he heard this, the story of there before, of the lineage of Pelt and Fang, she, he called out to them, but they did not speak people and she, he did not speak bear. And because she, he was not one of them, they walked right by the cage without even looking at it. The um, next piece I'll read comes from my collection, More in Doing for Having Been Broken. And this collection came about because, oh gosh, I'm trying to think about how long it was ago. Uh, more than 10 years ago, <laughs> when I was coming off my divorce, I went back to undergrad and moved in with my best friend from childhood. And living together as adults brought all sorts of trauma forward. And um, her family had lots of significant issues when we were growing up. And those were things that my friend had to deal with. And those were things that I saw and sometimes I was in the middle of. And uh, it occurred to me, <clears throat> living with this friend again, and now after that, another 10 years later, that this trauma and traumas in my own life were not things that were resolved. And I find strength in narratives where people can quote unquote overcome trauma, but uh, in this situation that that's not what's happened and it may never happen. And so this collection is, is one that responds to and considers trauma with young adults. Um, and I, a, a massive thank you to Black Lawrence Press for putting this out because they do a lot of strange things in this book that they, they didn't tell me I couldn't do. <laughs> um, and the story I'm gonna read today is the title story, More Undoing for Having Been Broken. And this piece came into existence after I had gone on a vacation to Arizona. And one of the things that I saw with my family at that time was Montezuma's Castle in Arizona. And if you're not familiar with the structure, it's, it's incredibly old, hundreds and hundreds of years old. And it's theorized that this structure, which is um, a quote unquote castle, right, into a cliff face, um, was built by a pre-Columbian culture, um, the Sanawa culture. And then, I don't know, three or 400 years later, uh, Apache and Yavapai also came in to occupy that area. And so, um, this story takes place in that location at an undetermined time in the past and um, has a time switch in the middle of it, a tense switch. So just to put that on your radar so it doesn't read too strangely when, when you hear it. This is more enduring for having been broken. When Emery stepped outside, he saw his mother watering the dirt again. Every morning at seven, she uncoiled the hose hanging from the side of the trailer and wet the ground, the sand, and the scrubby bushes. She said she had to drown the demons, all the Arizona bugs that masqueraded in carapace and with wings and with segmented bodies, forms that hid their true shapes. Water was the only way to keep them quiet, fill their mouths and they'd choke and die. And then eventually they would shrivel up, become husks, break apart, be absorbed by the good earth. Emery let the door slam behind him and the silence between him and his mother was thin and hot. 
He passed her wet red clay coating the sides and bottom of his no-name tennis shoes. The yard had fractured in sun after months of dry heat. In places, these fissures yawned for water, and Emery imagined the insects below ground, the confusion, and then swift death from the water hose. It upset him, and he fingered the money in his pocket. He'd been stealing a dollar every day for months from his mother's purse, and now he had $50 of guilt money that he was eager to get rid of. Tommy Endelson had a California king snake without a tongue. The woman who sold it to him said the snake had lost it in a fight with another snake, and now Tommy was tired of his broken pet. Emery said he'd buy it off Tommy. Snake, cage, wood bedding, bicycles, everything he had, and Tommy said, sure. Tommy's trailer wasn't that much nicer than Emery's, but Tommy did have a father who was almost 70 and still climbed mountains. It was this man that opened the door, standing with a cup of coffee in one hand. Hey, Buck, Emery said. Tommy home? Buck shook his head. He looked like a snow peak in the shadows, standing there in the doorway, gray hair flowing to his shoulders. He pointed to the hills with his mug, went out to the castle. Aren't you boys supposed to be in school anyway? One of the reasons Emery and Tommy were friends was because Emery's mother believed in demons and Tommy's father had a tendency to forget things like the length of summer vacation or to pay the electric bill. How long ago? Emery asked. Buck lowered his mug, raised it, swung it back and forth and coffee sloshed out, a dousing rod for time and children. An hour maybe? Okay, because I was supposed to buy his snake, Jipper. Emery hated the name Tommy had given the snake and was still contemplating a much better one. Yeah, he confirmed. Well, I'll bundle him up and drive him over for you. Thanks, Buck. I'm going to go find Tommy. Emery still had his hand in his pocket. The money was becoming soft with sweat. The castle was what the local kids called the cliff dwellings. They learned about them in school and also learned that the Barnoff family owned the land, but soon the castle would be federal property and they were already making plans for turning it into a national monument. The children had also learned that all the hiking up the steep hillside, the illegal tourists and artifact dealers had been eroding the 700 year old limestone complex. That didn't stop Emery and some of the other local kids from going up there though. They didn't see themselves as part of the destruction. It took 32 minutes of brisk walking to reach the castle from the trailer park. When Emery finally emerged from the footpath, Tommy was at the base of the dwellings, practicing his ninja moves. Tommy, Emery called, and the other boy's head whipped around. He was holding the severed spine of a yucca plant, a Spanish bayonet, Buck had called at once, and he was oddly small against the rising cliff face behind him. This was the first time Emery had ever seen anyone below the dwellings alone. In that complex, three stories high and shaded by a natural overhang, was massive above, almost threatening. Emery knew that the ceilings of the dwelling were less than five feet tall and that at almost five feet, he had to hunch to walk through rooms. At home once, he did an experiment where he walked around bent over for a few hours and then his neck and lower back hurt. He imagined the people who used to live in the dwellings had a painful life. Hey, Tommy called, wielding his sword. Emery jogged up to him, still breathing hard from the uphill walk. Before he reached the other boy, he had the money out, folded it in half, sharp crease at the middle, arm outstretched. I got the money, Emery said. Tommy let his sword arm drop. He didn't take the money, and Emery was scared that Tommy was going to backtrack and decide to keep his snake. Saw some guys out here earlier, Tommy said taking pictures and stuff. They said we can't be here anymore, but I told them they weren't cops and they didn't have a warrant. Who were they? Emery still had the money between them. Forest rangers or something. Oh, yeah. And they said they didn't need a warrant and that I didn't know what one was and they'd make sure no one ever messed with the place, but they left and I'm still here, so whatever. Emery was tired of waiting and he shook the money at Tommy. He knew the gesture looked frantic, made him look desperate. $50, he said, and then, as if his claim was staked and irrevocable, your dad's picked him up and taken him to my house. Oh, yeah, okay, sure. 
Tommy took the money, didn't count it, just shoved the wad into his pocket. I'm gonna buy something really cool with it, Tommy said, kicking the fruit off a prickly pear cactus and then crushing it underfoot. There's a bike for sale at the gas station and I'm gonna get that. Emory didn't care what Tommy did with the money, as long as he got the snake. California king snakes were immune to rattlesnake venom and could even eat them. Emory was impressed by this and would rather have a wounded predator than none at all. He was eager for Tommy to leave, spend the money, seal the deal, but the other boy was playing oblivious to Emory's anxiety and wouldn't budge. You wanna help me practice before it gets too hot? Tommy held up his bayonet and waved it like a wand. Emory didn't want to practice, but he also didn't want to make Tommy angry. Okay, he said, and Tommy rushed him, piercing Emory's left arm with a sharp plant, a small red spot exploding from his skin. Emory scrambles up the side of the rock and hears the word loser being yelled at him. His arms are scratched like railroad tracks and his right eye is swelling, but he finds the hand and footholds he needs and climbs up and up, scraping his stomach over the sill of hard baked clay tumbling inside the castle. He sits like this until laughter and curses stop. And when Emory pulls his head up from the cool darkness, there's no one below. The opening he peeks out of is at an awkward height. Standing, Emory's nose is pressed against the ancient clay, breathing in musty dust and centuries, his eyes just clear the edge. It might have been a door or a window, or maybe some type of lookout hole. The ceiling slopes down farther into the dwelling, where Emory stands is the only place he can remain completely upright. He is on the second floor of the dwelling and he's forgotten how dark and still it is inside. The small openings throughout the complex are strategically placed for a cross breeze, but Emery knows if fires were lit, the interior would be heavy with smoke. He'd done that once as well, hauled up dry twigs and leaves and one of his mother's lighters and tried camping when she was going through a difficult spell. He'd been smoked out and returned home defeated and smelling of campfire. The room is dusty. There are no footprints on the floor and Emery wonders how long it's been since anyone climbed up. The castle is a dying place, inhabited occasionally by trailer park kids who have to find their own fun, who can't buy it. Emery's face throbs. He and the castle are the same thing, beaten and broken, only no one is coming to save Emery. His mother is at work at the diner and when she comes home, she will be frightened by the way he looks and then she will be angry. And then she will go to sleep with the sound of the TV too loud. And the next morning, he'll wake up to the sound of water pelting the metal siding of the trailer. Only tonight, tonight there will be the snake. When Emery is in his room, the snake will be there like some sure king and at least one thing will be different and bright. Emery spends the day in the castle, moving like wind through the rooms, all three floors, some split level dream, napping on the castle roof in the shade of the limestone overhang, scraping bat shit off the roof with his nails, wondering how many bats actually live in the castle now. He wonders when the rangers will come back, if it'll be later today, and if when they find him, they'll write him a ticket or worse, arrest him. This fear nags at him until he decides it will be better to face his mother than to go to jail. He climbs down the narrow stairs to the first level of the castle, to the largest opening, but movement catches his eye near the doorway. It is a red velvet ant. What he knows is actually a wingless female wasp, winding a looping path in the sunlight towards the shade. Its head, thorax, and legs are black and fuzzy its abdomen in orange red. The red velvet ant is about half an inch long and Emery crouches down on his heels to get a better look. Why the female wasp is called an ant, he doesn't understand. Adults are supposed to be the smart ones, the correct ones. How hundreds, if not thousands of people could be misled by one wrong word escapes him. Emery sees the ant leaving many small lines in the dust a cryptographic script by legs. He can almost see the words. It could be Latin, he thinks, or Greek, though he's never seen either language. 
but he does know the understanding is almost there. He is the snake without a tongue and cannot quite discern what is hiding. The wasp is now at the base of the wall and begins to climb up it. It arcs along until it disappears into a crack in the adobe that Emery didn't notice. He scrapes his feet in the dust and shuffles towards it, careful not to smear the insect's language. He looks out the door again, imagines his mother arriving home in the Plymouth, her careful steps across the front yard, her eyes searching for red velvet ants, her hurried hand twisting a key. Emery begins to kick in the wall. He knows this place is sacred to someone, maybe not now, but it was. And he knows soon enough, he won't be allowed to hide in the castle anymore. He decides he'll make his mark. No one will ever know it was him. He'll be invisible, but permanent. The last of the dried mud from his shoes is kicked loose and it crumbles to the ground. Emery fears for a moment that his force, his anger might bring the whole castle down the cliffside and that they'll find him buried in it days from now, a modern king in a castle's grave. But then he decides he doesn't care. He continues to kick and the crack lengthens, the small, gap, the small gap broadening, and he kicks until the wall breaks and there is darkness and ash beyond. It's a small chamber and in the center is a prickly pear cactus, its oblong purple fruit erupting from the pads. Emery knows plants don't grow where there is no sun. But the sun is setting and the room is dark and it is too strange to explore when there is no light. He vows to come back in the morning when perhaps some small shaft will reveal itself. And he heads home, dusty and beaten. His mother's car is parked next to the trailer and the porch light is burned out. He climbs the stairs and almost kicks the snake's glass cage in. Chipper is wound around a rock and Emery can see a piece of paper taped to the top of the cage. Take the snake back. It is his mother's handwriting. And Emery feels like his eye is more swollen than it is, like the red wound that is on his arm that he knows is too puffy is over his heart instead. He should have seen this coming and he knows it. Emery goes inside. His mother is in front of the television and Emery, instead of arguing with her, gets a flashlight from the kitchen drawer and lets the front door slam shut. He turns on the flashlight and looks into the cage, the snake black and cream and the light. He puts the note in his pocket. The bag of now thawing mycicles is on the ground and Emery loops the handles over his left hand. He opens the cage, balancing the flashlight between his chin and shoulder and lifts the snake out. It is smooth and soft and shining and calm. It is smaller than he remembers it being, and it moves slowly between his hands. Emery notices two bulges in different places on its body, herniated muscles, he remembers now, from fighting with that other snake. He drapes the snake over his neck, turns off the flashlight, and begins walking. On the way to the castle, the snake makes a strange weight it moves over his body, but never attempts to escape him. It does not try to crawl into the bag with its food. It circles a path around him in the same language of the wingless wasp. And again, Emery can almost decipher the words. In the sky, he can see the crescent moon over a mesa, a shark fin at the surface. And he remembers his teacher telling the class that at one point in time, Arizona was underwater. During the Paleozoic era, Arizona was an ocean. He knows that the scorpions he cannot see, small and brown ones, had ancestors that were eight feet long and lived at the bottom of that ocean. It was so dark at those depths that the scorpions would flash phosphorescence to attract mates. Snakes too might have come from the ocean, evolving from an aquatic lizard. And Emery wonders if his snake and a gila monster would ignore each other fight or silently accept their common origins in the ocean that used to drown this land. When Emery reaches the base of the castle, the snake is still calm and steady, unhurried and unconcerned. Emery climbs the dark rock face. 
the plastic bag rips and he has to tuck his shirt into his shorts and carry the plastic, feel, plastic sealed food against his stomach. The snake winds its head into Emery's sleeve and hesitates against his collarbone before emerging at the neckline. In the castle, it is darker than Emery could have imagined. He looks out the doorway and sees the stars, the Milky Way. Small bats dive, profiled against the sky, and when Emery switches on his flashlight and shines it in their direction, they are like dark comets bombarding heavily towards the ground. The snake rests its head in the crook of Emery's arm. The flashlight illuminates the floor and Emery sees that he's tracking a path through the wasp's language. He carries the snake into that small room. It stays pressed against him, warm and relaxed as Emery searches with the flashlight for where the sunlight might come from. As he does this, lines begin to appear on the walls and as he looks closer, he realizes there are drawings in the small chamber. They are thick and unsteady. And when Emery stands back to assess the room, twisting the glass of the flashlight's lens to take it in all at once, there is color in the dark. The cactus is the color of pine needles. The fruit is darker at the top than its base, white bubbling into pastel eggplant. The drawings are words he doesn't know in cobalt blue and burnt orange and tea rose pink and red, dozens of red velvet ants escaping this nebula and taking the red dwarf bodies into a hole in the adobe near the cactus. Emery pulls the snake from his body gently and places it on the floor of the room. He peels back the plastic around the thawed mice and he places them next to it. The snake wraps around the dead bodies, perhaps to protect its food, perhaps to protect the memory of what had lived. Emery waits for a solid hour, willing the snake to extend its tongue to taste the place and tell him in some small way that it understands. But the snake doesn't do this, can't do it. And Emery has to tell himself that it knows, knows this new home, knows it doesn't need a stupid name, knows it doesn't need a tongue, and that injury does not constitute an ability to thrive. And it knows he's going to leave it and never come back. The snake remains impassive, dark eyes that seem to be seeing everything but nothing at the same time. And Emery leaves the room, leaves the castle, and begins his walk home. Thank you. Oh my goodness, that was wonderful, Gwendolyn. Thank you so much. Um, I know I always I want to clap um, to have there be the sound of clapping, but <laughs> the sound of one person clapping. I don't know how that how that sounds. Um, that was gorgeous. What I couldn't bring myself to write something in the chat because it was such a spell. I was under the spell of listening to you, but um, the the characters and the places that you described and your descriptions were just amazing. Um, that crescent moon, the snake, the wasp that was called an ant. Um, and from earlier, disco balls and licorice and meat smoothies, <laughs> amazing. Um, and there's something really great about the way that you write about language and naming. I, I especially love hearing how that came in and out um, throughout and kind of the adults versus the children too. That was really cool. So much to love. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to turn to our next reader. If, if you're just joining us, we have two amazing readers. We just heard from Gwendolyn Paradise and we're going to hear next from Rebecca Pelkey. So Rebecca Pelkey is a member of the Brothertown Indian Nation of Wisconsin and a native of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Her first poetry collection was Horizon of the Dog Woman from St. Julian Press in 2020. Her second collection, Through a Red Place, Prusia Press 2021, won the Prusia Press Prize. Pelkey's co-authored Hiking Guide to Michigan's Upper Peninsula was published by Falcon Guides in 2021. Rebecca, you've had kind of a banner few years here. 
Um, she holds a PhD from the University of Missouri, an MFA from Northern Michigan University, and is an assistant professor of film studies at Clarkson University in upstate New York. Welcome, Rebecca Pelkey. Kwai, hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Gwen, thank you for that awesome reading. I'm excited to talk about it um, in a little bit. And of course, um, thank you to Rebecca and Beverly and everyone at Bergia Press for setting up this reading and for publishing my, my little book. Um, I, I wasn't going to read this poem that I'm going to read. I hadn't picked this one out to read tonight, but listening to Gwen's short story just now actually made me want to read this one. Um, I, I was thinking while you were reading about some of the common themes in our work, um, even though we write in very different forms and styles, there were things I was thinking about that were overlapping. And so that made me want to read this poem. So I'm going to start with this. It's called Bird Mound Facing Devil's Lake. Um, this book is mostly set in Wisconsin, which is the place where sort of all of my ancestors converged from different, different areas. Um, and I really wanted to interrogate. One of the things I wanted to interrogate was how different people use spaces. And I think that's what Gwen's reading made me think about. And so this is... Um, a state park in Wisconsin called Devil's Lake State Park. And there are um, effigy mounds there from, um, from indigenous cultures um, from before the, the, the groups that we know were here uh, when Europeans came. Um, I, wanna, I wanna say Mississippian culture, but I'm not sure that's actually correct. So, um, and so anyway, I'm just gonna read this. This is called Bird Mound Facing Devil's Lake. The lake was here long before the devil held sway in Wisconsin. And by that name, I mean where the river runs through the red place. Devil's Lake isn't its first name, but settlers heard Spirit Lake, Dawa Kashagra, and Red Evil in the earthbound sacred. A lake without inlet or outlet could only be bound to the underworld and we know what that means. The story is Devil's Lake was part of the river once until glaciers came and went, leaving moraines in the gorges and forcing the river to bow around Baraboo's hills. There's something sad about that, like the lake is a child caged and curled in a ball and the river a mother chewing through a wall of bedrock to return. Bird mound could be a swallowtailed kite about to take off from the shoreline. Their range before we came once included the borders of Wisconsin. And by that, by that name, I mean the state that won't recognize my tribe, though we came here before the land was cut on dotted lines. Or maybe Bird Mound is really Thunderbird, about to be dragged into the lake by Mishibiju, the underwater panther. It's a story I heard once about this place. There's an underwater panther mound across the lake, maybe squaring up. Mishibiju will drown you, they say. Or maybe Thunderbird has finally climbed out onto the shore and now he rests. Maybe one day he'll wake up and the cliffs of Wisconsin will shudder again with his voice. Right now, it's tourist season in Wisconsin. And by that name, I mean the state whose motto is forward. A slow wave of people come and go, giving little attention to bird mound blooming with prairie plants. The water draws them, and after all, Devil's Lake is just a name, and these vacationers have forgotten to fear spirits, at least in daylight. At some point, enough people cut across one wing so that it could be broken, a rutted trail bisecting a small hill prairie. Maybe it felt like an echo of great adventure, for children raised to set themselves as kings of every hill, but not to see every hill as a king. Hummingbirds dart over bird mound between the purple spider wart, maybe looking for something more to their liking, or maybe from the sky, they see themselves writ large among the prairie plants. Who doesn't want to be closer to their gods? 
When a friend posts pictures on Facebook of camping and hiking around Devil's Lake, there are no photos of the mounds, which isn't surprising. If you picked up the guidebook, they'd be tucked in the far back. But in one lake shot from a rise above, I can see where bird mounds should be behind the trees next to the picnic shelter and the beach. People go or maybe arrive wading in. From this perspective, it might look like bird mound was about to fly to settle its feathers of switchgrass and prairie drop seed before pushing off over the green water of Spirit Lake. Um, so now I'm gonna go on to the, the poem I was actually going to start with. Uh, so the, the book is organized uh, by the Mohegan lunar cycle, which starts the year with the maple sugar moon, which is around March for us, and then um, ends with the snow waiting moon, which usually happens in about February. Um, tonight is a full moon, uh, coincidentally, so I thought I would read the, the short poem for tonight's full moon, which the Mohegans know as the hunting moon. Um, I'm going to read the Mohegan version first, and then I'll read the English translation. Um, and I say this before every reading. Uh, Mohegan is still a new language for me. I'm still learning. Um, I'm doing okay with, with reading and writing, but speaking, I still will probably stumble a couple of times. There's no, there's not a lot of pronunciation guides, so I'm going to struggle through it. Wiyun Pasuga Bilgan. Wiyun Man Patap Shatonk. Wunapi. Kupayakmas, Kupanaman Muks, Nita Kupayoa, Akwe Chakan Yo Masanaman, Muskanawanman Naspi, Ashwank Wiyun. Ninth Moon. When the moon has spilled its water, we will put the wolf in the forest. My heart is closed. What is it like when you touch it? We will see by the hunting moon. The other thing that um, is about to happen is I, uh, I'm about to leave for Thanksgiving break to go um, back to my home state of Michigan. Um, and this has become, I've, for many years I've lived about somewhere between nine and 12 hours away from home and I drive this sort of back and forth and it's it's mostly been north and south now because I'm in upstate New York. It's more of an east-west drive, but I've come to sort of regard this drive as, as a kind of ceremony for me. I look forward to the drive as much as the being home. And there's something that is um, very fulfilling for me about the drive itself. And so um, I wrote this on one of, one of these drives. It's called Crossing the Midwest on the Winter Solstice. On the shortest day, I leave and arrive in darkness. Sunrise, sunsets, reds in the windshield, the rear view. In the short light, billboards for Jesus plod by, homes that grow line by line along fenced fields of dirty snow. Their forced rhyme, hand paint, screams, we all need guns to keep the bad guys at bay. Hawks in the leafless trees, hawk after hawk until it's the same hawk again, the same gray branches. I've passed this way so many times before, but this is my ceremony, this long drive north, the span of land and daylight. These are the lines that cross, that bind me again and again to this place until it's the once plains that cross me, generations in the making. So the book is um, very visual, and I'm not sure if you're <laughs> if you're going to be able to see this, but I'll hold it up. So um, I this is a the book is sort of a research project to me. I'm I'm responding to a lot of archival material. I'm responding to being in places, so field research and archival research. Um, and I wanted that to be in this book. I wanted it to feel a bit like the reader was 
not just hearing my words, but in a way walking through some of this with me. So I really wanted the images of documents and maps and things like that to be included in the book. Um, and I was thrilled that Purdue was willing to, willing to work with me on doing something that is, you know, can be difficult to do and difficult to design. So um, this is one of the, the images that I was pretty excited about. If you can sort of see it a little bit, it's a, it's a pedigree chart, like you would map your family lineage on. And, um, and so sort of superimposed over that is the poem and the poem sort of almost takes the form of the, the pedigree chart in a way too. Um, so, and this one is about, as I was doing a lot of this research and finding names and dates and things like that, it all felt like not enough. Like I didn't, I didn't know these people because I didn't have their stories, right? It felt very incomplete to me. And this poem is sort of a, a reflection of that. It's called Pedigree. There's something skeletal about it, though we call them trees. They seem unfleshed, like they'll never be more than dug up bones laid out and labeled on bleached tables. Pedigree, it needs thicker sinew, the raw red meat of stories to flesh the bony processes of names and dates. It needs the scarred skin of history, even if just to peel it away. Pedigree, as if bread, like it all comes down to me and now I'm at some show balancing on bones stacked end to end, like I'm here to score my color and form, strip back my imperfect skin to read what's written in my blood. Sort of um, pairing with that, I'm gonna read another short poem and this is responding to archival documents as well. Um, one of my Mohegan ancestors have the last name Cochegan. And so when I was doing archival work, I just sort of put that name in to see what would come up. And one of the documents that came up was this list of registered bulls. Um, and it was very, it was a very strange thing to see the name Cochegan on this list of, of breeding stock. Um, and then as I started to scan the list, I saw other, quite a few other Native American names on this list. And I was sort of at thinking about that. This is the short poem that came out of that. And it's called Cochigan. When written, Kogagan, Kuchigam, Skigan, the names of my Mohegan ancestors, the name of a boulder dropped on what would be Connecticut where my family once met. The name of a bull owned by Colt Samuel C. on an index of bulls with names like Indiana Chief or Chesapeake Chief or Catarugas Chief. All these butchered names, such strange honors. Um, and Cochegan Rock is a, is a giant glacial boulder in Connecticut. And it's called Cochegan Rock because that is where um, my ancestors gathered. Uh, my Mohegan ancestor gathered at that rock for many years before colonization happened. Um, and I haven't been there yet. It's, it's, uh, it belongs to the Mohegan tribe and you have to get permission now to hike back there, but that's on, in my plans for next summer, hopefully. Um, so I, I told you the book was organized by the Mohegan lunar calendar and I did about half of the months in the Mohegan lunar cycle and I did the other half of the months as the, the calendar that we use. Um, and since I'm talking about cows, I'll just read this. This is the, for the month of May. And I was trying to, the way I did this, I was trying to, the, the Mohegan month poems, moon poems are based on stories. Each of those moons has stories attached to it. Um, the reason that they're called those things. And I was trying to figure out how to do that the same way with, or similarly at least with the, the Western months. Um, and this is for May and I can't remember, I think, 
I'm trying to remember now how I came across the story as attached to May. Um, and I think it was the uh, a German celebration that er, some of the early settlers had, um, but how that's changed because Wisconsin is very much a place of, of dairy farmers now and how that changed things. So this is called, um, oh, that's why, that, I know I remember, sorry, um, May is the month where you can often milk a cow three times a day for some reason, or that time of year is the, you're gonna get the best milk production, I think. So this is called the month of three milking. May has no more time for witches. In Wisconsin, Walpurgisnacht makes way for dairy farmers who get up too early for late night revels with old Germanic gods. In 2017, a Wisconsin Holstein broke the world record for milk production. Her owner says, my gold was born for greatness. Um, so this is one, and this has a, a image. So this is a Google map. Again, it's really, it's pretty hard to see, but the poem is superimposed over a Google map image of a specific area in southwestern Wisconsin. And it's the place where there's a cemetery called the Revels Family Cemetery. And it's where my Cherokee, Eastern Cherokee ancestors are buried. Um, and this poem is about me trying to, again, to get to it and not being successful getting there. And it's called Echnestus II. Um, and the word Echnestus is, a bio, biology term and it mostly refers to animals but it's the um the place on the back on your back where you can't reach or the place on an animal's back where it can't reach so i i did three of these agnestis poems and they're all very much about like what i can't find like the searching and not being able to find certain things uh so this is agnestis too I drive the rental car back and forth on the same stretch of curving road back to the same gravel turnaround on the porch of a sagging feed store with a Purina logo, logo fading from the blue wooden siding. An old man watches my car come and go again. I'm looking for a gate, a road assigned to get me to the Revels family cemetery. I know where it should be up in the hills but the trees are a screen and the rock face the road curves around and the pasture fence snug to the other shoulder don't leave anywhere to park and walk. Between me and where my Cherokee ancestors rest are acres of muddy spring pasture and a herd of Jersey cows. I can see the place on Google Earth. There are no roads, no two tracks, maybe the faint line of a path, a margin of hedge on the hillside, white dots that might be headstones. On findagrave.com, I can pull up pictures of the stones, read a line about lineage. Even here in the car, far from any town or tower, I can do this. But I want my hands in their dirt. I want to trace my fingers down the chiseled stone. I want to leave tobacco, a story. But there's no way in I can find without climbing the fence and risking both the rancher and the bulls. I think about asking the man at the feed store, but we're alone in the middle of nowhere and everything I know has taught me that's a bad idea. By now, the sun is touching the hilltops and I'm too deep in Wisconsin's river lands to be out by dark. So I don't turn in at the gravel dead end. Instead, I give in again to missing what's just out of reach. I uh, I didn't realize until I read those three poems in a row how much I talk about cows. I guess that makes sense for Wisconsin, but I never noticed it before. Uh, so this poem isn't in the Mohegan language, but it's about the Mohegan language. Um, I've thought a lot about language since starting to try to learn uh, Mohegan, which has been really a difficult journey for me, but also um, really important to me understanding the world from a Mohegan perspective. Um, I didn't understand how much language informed the way we see the world until I started doing this. And 
one of the things that this poem considers is in Mohegan, there are no adjectives, which doesn't mean there are colors, right? Anything that we think of as an adjective, like um, colors and size and things like that are all verbs in Mohegan. So um, something is currently being this color, but it could be being a different color in a few minutes, right? So there's a, the world is very much open to change and this way nothing is sort of stationary in the way that we see it. And um, that really changed my idea of how Mohegan people view the world in some ways. And there's no gender either. There's animate and inanimate things, but there's no gendered things. So that is also was interesting to me. But um, so this is a sonnet. Um, I like writing sonnets or at least sonnet-esque sort of things. I write pretty naturally in that length and in iambic, um, iambic pentameter close to it. So this is a sonnet for the Mohegan language. Without an adjective, there is no blue for bird or sky or water, which is not to say a colorless world. See the hue just there of a bird being red as it builds a nest of twigs and bits of wire being gray or being rusty. There is room like Cricket laughing himself into fire for a bird to blacken sometime soon. The nest as well might find its niche being small and happy while it waits for eggs and then a family to stretch the edge for love and size to make it great. The Mohegan world isn't static, but flows prismatic. Each of us moves in rainbows. I think I'm gonna read another of, I gotta find it. I didn't have this one marked, but then I, I kind of never know exactly what I'm gonna read before I start a reading. I sort of let the reading direct me to where I wanna go next. Um, this is another Agnestis poem. This is the first one. I did spend quite a bit of time in cemeteries, um, which makes me think of, we were just talking about Buffy the Vampire Slayer and how Buffy is called she who hangs out in cemeteries sometimes. So this sort of makes me think of that. But if you're old enough to know Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, and this is, uh, this was at a different cemetery in Wisconsin, it's Agnesis one. My mother and I walk back and forth down crooked lines of intermittent headstones, some so covered by grass that they can't be read. It's sad, we say to each other, that no one comes. No one kicks back the clippings or tears away what's overgrown. It's hot for June in northern Wisconsin, and moving keeps the mosquitoes at bay when the breeze dies. We're in a place once called Potter's Field for those too poor to pay for burial, or who have no one to take care of them in death. The woman in the office, who I go to when we, our search is fruitless, tells me in a hush that they don't call it that anymore. She says some 60%, she says some 60 percent of the graves are unmarked, that all the space I walked on like lawn was gridded full. She has a map, dug up from a back room, rolled into a tube and flaking like dead skin. The transparent paper displays a crowded quilt of names. There was an outbreak, she says, lots of people at the same time. When I ask if they'd ever digitize the map, she brushes, brushes this off with a why bother shrug. Nobody much comes looking. I click pictures on my phone nonetheless. Back in section T, I know where I'm going. I know from the faded script on the map, from the names on the headstones next to them, the one's kitty corner. I judge the length of lawn between bodies with my own. They're here, I tell my mother, unmarked. She doesn't understand, but it's important that I stand on the exact spot, as if I have to align myself just right, as if I'm waiting for family to puzzle into place, a cat's cradle of stretched string that will snap itself to a grid, the perfect tension telling me that this is finally where I fit. Oh, let's see, maybe one more. Um, I'll just do one more. Um, I try to remember that being a poet means 
being vulnerable, being a writer in general means being vulnerable, really putting yourself on the page. And that can be really difficult. Um, it can be the most difficult thing, I think. And um, this is one of the, the harder poems for me to have written and for me to read. And so that's why I'm gonna finish with it because it is difficult and it should be read. Um, this is called Landmines. My father's stories got lost. Some died in jungles with names I don't know where so many stories ended up in unmarked graves. Others, I suspect, were muttered into empties then broken in alleys. I don't know how to piece those. I heard once he pulled a gun on my uncle for drug money. What memories I have are of black eyes that never rested. I've heard other stories too, but those are not for you. Some stories are told without being spoken. Some stories are between mothers and daughters. There's a wide white space, a gutter between my father and me clear-cut jungle, stories planted with landmines. I find shards that could be excavated, glued carefully together. I do this from a safe distance, from musty archives and computer screens. On Google Street View, I study a house he lived in next to the premier sports bar, three houses down from the county liquor store. It's late fall by the leaves, there's a man with a blurred face looking into the camera, passing a plastic Santa and old jack-o'-lanterns. It could be him looking back, and at this thought I'm small, crouching at a crack in the bedroom door, about to be seen. That story ends with a blank space, but old fear still closes in, and I close the map and all the other tabs. Some stories belong underground, unfound. Landmines seethe like yellow jacket nests. Everyone knows it's best to leave them alone. So, Courtney, thank you very much. Rebecca, thank you so much. Um, such a beautiful reading. Again, <laughs> yay. <laughs> I am so pleased that you closed with that poem. I, so I'm encountering Gwendolyn's work those pieces for the first time and these pieces I feel like I'm encountering for the first time even though we've worked on them in the book and made the book just to hear you read them into the space to have that bravery and to talk about them and the stories that are behind them just really beautiful um, absolutely love the idea of a genderless um, culture and language and the, a world open to change. And that brings mm -hmm. me back to Gwendolyn and pronouns and um, that the language informing um, the way that we see the world, I think is, is really beautiful thing. Um, I wanted to open us up to a Q&A. We have about 20 minutes left. I'm so grateful to both of you for your work and your words and would love to hear some whatever folks want to hear about. I have some questions, but I encourage folks to put their questions into the chat so we can we can hear um, what other people would like to know about. Uh, Vanessa has a question. Vanessa Deanna is a professor at Westfield State, um, teaches an intro to Native American lit course here at Westfield. And her question is Gwendolyn's castle story and Rebecca's spirit lake and cemetery poems made me think about how places carry stories and spark our imagination. Could you both comment on how you think about places in your writing? Do you consider your ways of thinking about place as specifically indigenous? Great question. I'm gonna put us back on gallery view too, so we can kind of be in the room together. And that question is in the chat. So if you need to look back at it. Thank you, Vanessa. Gwen, do you want to start or do you want me to start? Uh, I, I have I have no preference. I'm speaking, so maybe I'll just go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I consider myself a place writer. Um, when I was going through all the levels of academe, right, MA, MFA, PhD, and doing all that, I studied primarily nonfiction. And um, over the years, I decided to not make that um, my 
larger body of work because it felt too too vulnerable. Like I got really tired of feeling like I had to be vulnerable and publish in order to survive in, in academe. So I moved over to fiction. Um, but a lot of the thinking that I did in my nonfiction has to do with place. I've spent a lot of time thinking about cultural geography, about theory of place, um, theory of space. And obviously when we're thinking about these things, um, it also has to do with, with occupation. And I mean that like in all variations of that word. Um, I, I can't remember really the last time I wrote anything where setting or place was not integral to that narrative. It, it's just always there. Um, and I tell my students that I feel like I'm hyper aware of place for two reasons. The first being that uh, because I'm, I'm hard of hearing, I have to pay attention to what's going on around me like way more than other people or else I risk getting in trouble, right? Or not hearing something that signals me to like danger or whatnot. Um, and then two, you know, like it's, just everywhere you move in this country, like it, it is occupied territory. And I'm hyper aware of that at all times. I'm hyper aware of that, especially when I'm working or visiting university spaces, um, land grant universities. And uh, I, it's just not something um, that is ever not present on my mind. And I, I think I feel that way because I'm Cherokee. I uh, have friends that are able to navigate the world and, and who don't have this as part of their daily thinking. Um, and that's just not, that's just not my position in life. So I'll give it to you, Becky. <laughs> yeah, I, um, this came up in another reading that I, I've asked before if, if people think that you can fall in love with the place as strongly as you can sort of fall in love with another person. And for me, that answer is yes. And there, there are places that are just in my soul and I write from them unintentionally. My first book, Horizon of the Dog Woman, I almost titled it Not One Without Water, which is a line from, uh, I think it's D.H. Lawrence's poem uh, or a quote, but also, I couldn't write a poem that didn't have water in it because places with water are so integral to myself, the way I, the way I perceive the world, I couldn't not write that. So, um, and I was never really, I don't think I was really cognizant of it as such until more recently, but I read a book um, called Prairie Earth by an indigenous writer named William least heat moon and he writes about and talks about um the deep map of a place and that this deep map is like all the stories of that place all the different aspects of that place not just sort of a flat two-dimensional map the way we see it the way we tend to think of it in western culture and after that book really made me really think about how i think about space too um in, and had always thought about space in different ways, like navigating by landmarks, which my mother used to hate when I would do that, navigate by landmarks instead of like street signs and things like that. But, um, and is that innate, are all those things innately indigenous? I don't know about that, but I think I, I can't, I can't see the world outside of my own identity either. So yes, I do think it's specifically indigenous, indigenous because I'm indigenous, but I, I wouldn't say it's that way for everyone who identifies as indigenous. Wow, great question and great answers. I This kind of leads into a question I wanted to bring into the room. I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about how your Native American heritage comes into your writing um, or not. And so with Rebecca's Perugia book, Through a Red Place, it's in large part concerned with the search for and the honoring of that heritage. Um, but I feel like it can also be a powerful choice for a person with um, marginalized and intersection, intersecting identities to not focus on identity and just write about being human. Um, and so um, I wanted to, like, like to not have the burden of having to 
um, write about identity and just have that be sort of part of what's there on the page, um, if, if that makes sense. So I, I wanted to ask you to speak each to how your heritage comes into, but also doesn't come into your creative writing. Um, I can start this time, Gwen, since you started the last time. Um, yeah, like you said, obviously this book is deeply sort of entrenched in this, my sort of trying to figure out identity. So, and it is, it can't, there's a, there is, as I think Gwen was suggesting, maybe there's another level of labor that goes into writing that and talking about that. And it's like, it's an emotional labor. It's a, it's attached to generational trauma. And for me, some of what I'm doing with this book is trying to like get that out and, you know, try to figure it out and in some ways heal from it and things like that. But at the same time, it is also, it's a difficult thing to do. So, um, and I, I know that, so if I, for example, submit some pieces of writing and I and I put in my bio that I'm from the Brothertown Indian Nation or that I'm Mohegan. I always think that they're going to expect my writing then to be about that, whoever reads that. And if it's not, then they might say, well, why is this person? Well, we don't want this if this person isn't writing about that. So that is something I think about um, as far as the market and publishing. Um, and I'm not, that's not the way it should be necessarily, but it's definitely something that I've thought about. And so I haven't decided what my next book is going to be, but I'm sort of um, leaning away from, I don't know that I'm done with this work yet that I'm doing with Through a Red Place, but I might take a break from it because I might need a break from it. Yeah, Becky, I really appreciate you saying that um, sometimes when you submit, you you wonder if there's an expectation on the part of readers or editors for the, the content of the material you're putting forward. I definitely feel the same way. Um, and I think at this point in my career, how much I overtly address my heritage and my identity is project specific. Um, and so with my first two books that went out to the world, um, I, I know some things about these books that the readers don't know and that I don't feel like I need to put explanations into my books for, you know, like I know there are characters in this short story collection um, who have Cherokee ancestry. And like, I know those characters backstories. I had to build that for the world of my story, but then it's not in the, like, I don't explicitly state it in the story. So I know that some readers come to this book and are probably just reading default white protagonist or main characters. And that's, and that's not the case. Um, I, maybe what Becky's doing with this book of hers is similar to what I'm doing with my novel right now. Hopefully I'm on the last revision right before it goes to market, we'll see. Um, but that book is, is all about identity politics and cultural trauma and missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, that, uh, there's no way to read that project without saying like, this is the overarching concern of this novel. Um, and I already know that there's a good chance that book will be marketed with own voices, um, which I, it's like, I, I appreciate that and we need to have recognition and we need to support each other and we need to know how to find native and indigenous writers. Um, but I do feel restricted in the sense that I feel like that's expected of me. Um, it's expected and sometimes I think that like, yeah, like I have a cultural responsibility as well. So it's, it's a hard place to be in. Um, and I just kind of have to balance, like Becky said, like maybe I'll take a break from this work, right? And then I'll come to it. Like I, I do, I have to sort of like think about that kind of labor and when I can and can't do it. Cause even revising this last book, the, the novel, oh my gosh, it was so silly y'all. There were times that I'd be out there like on my computer in the backyard and I just like start crying, right? Because something that the protagonist is going through, I'm like, holy shit, like th this is me. Like I'm writing myself into this character. 
And there were so many times like that. And I think, yeah, it's, it's kind of like worn me out at this moment and I'll probably take a break and then come back to it. Thank you so much. Those were really generous answers. And Gwendolyn, you said in passing, we have to be able to find um, the indigenous writers and just that was a little thread there, but I, it does make me think I wanted to ask one question of you both. Um, we love your writing and we would love to read more contemporary writers um, who also share Native American heritage. And I wonder if you could each recommend one other contemporary indigenous writer or, or writers plural whose work you admire that we could kind of take with us as recommendations. Yes, I mean, there are so many um, great ones. I mean, for poetry, um, the, the first name that always uh, comes to mind, interestingly enough for me, is Tommy Pico, who is um, a queer indigenous poet um, his sort of big breakthrough book was called Nature Poem, and he has a couple of others too now. And he um, he writes about how as an indig indigenous person, he can't write a nature poem because that's exactly what's expected of him. <laughs> so um, I just, he's it, he writes in a very, very different style than I do, but I've always been drawn to like this type of writing that's very contemporary that I can't figure out how to do myself. And then for fiction, I'd recommend um, uh, Cynthia Latish Smith's um, YA novel called Hearts Unbroken, which I just adored. Um, and it's about a, a high school girl, indigenous high school girl, sort of navigating uh, predominantly white space. Um, it's a great book. Rebecca, if you can put that in the chat, that would be so helpful. Thank you. I want to like, Becky, you get the, the high five from me. Tommy Pico was also going to be one of the first people um, I mentioned. And I have to say that one of the writers that was really foundational to me was Alyssa um, Washuda. And uh, mm -hmm. Washuda's, I think, only a nonfiction writer. I've never encountered anything else that she's written. Um, but her first book, My Body is a Book of Rules, was a collection that came out that was really important to me for thinking about what the essay could look like and what it could do and how it could sort of like touch and flee and avoid. Um, a lot of hermit crab stuff there that really spoke to what I needed at the time. And then uh, her new book is out, White Magic, as well. I would highly recommend that collection. Um, I want to also uh, think about Coley Driscoll's work. Um, and I think there's a great anthology of two-spirited writing that incorporates mm -hmm. uh, multi-genre work that I would recommend. Um, and then finally, I just recently read, I had to pull it up in my browser because I couldn't remember the writer's name and that made me feel like a terrible person. There was a novel that I loved called This Town Sleeps by Dennis Staples. Um, and that novel is, really experimenting with narrative structure and how time unfolds. And one of the things that I really appreciate this book, appreciate about this book, like with a lot of other, I think, um, indigenous writing I've encountered is the use of the speculative and how what a lot of people would think speculative fiction is changes within indigenous context, right? It's like not impossible anymore. It's about worldview. Um, I would absolutely put that, that book into the mix. Um, I think those would be maybe right now like my top three. Amazing. Gwendolyn, if there's any way you can remember any of those things and put yes, them Yes, I will. I'm going to, yeah. I'll type them. I'm a slow typer. So give me a sec here. Thank you. So we have about five minutes left. I, I don't, didn't want my questions to be the only one. So I'm really glad we started with Vanessa's. Um, so we might have time for two more. I'm, I'm going to ask one more I really wanted to know, which is that um, these two writers both received their PhDs from, from Mizzou. Um, and I wanted you to talk about the importance of creative friendships in the life of writers, either your particular friendship or about writing community in general, or both. I think that would just help any, it would be interesting to any writer 
in the room um, in terms of friend, their friendships and their writing communities. Becky, can uh, you go first while I type? Yeah, definitely. So um, I started at Mizzou one, just a year or two years. I can't remember, Gwen, one year before Gwen. I think it was one. Yeah, and when she came to visit before joining the program, she actually stayed at my apartment coincidentally because we we would offer housing to, to to potential incoming students so that was our first our first meeting and she put up with my big furry cat <laughs> and um and so i think for me my first year there i didn't have any um uh co-colleagues in, at the graduate student level who were in also indigenous. And um, that was difficult. Um, and there were there was a white faculty member teaching uh, um, indigenous studies classes, but um, I think it's important to have a writing community, but I also think it's important for indigenous people to have an indigenous writing community, if at all possible. Um, and I think that writing community is something I, in grad school, was something I actually really took for granted until I went off and got a job at a university that doesn't have an English department or doesn't have a creative writing department. And now um, I'm very thankful to still have that, you know, that community that I established at Mizzou because um, it's, it's hard being sort of the only creative writer, harder than I thought it would be um, once you don't have that anymore. So um, don't take it for granted while you have it in school and then try to maintain it beyond school if you can. That's sort of, I guess, my advice on that. Yeah, it was such a happy coincidence when I went to Mizzou for visiting and, um, and bunked with Becky. That was, it made me feel like like there might be like a person for me because I have been, gosh, I, I, I love to be alone. Like it's one of my favorite things. Just like not talk to people. That's <laughs> just who I am. Um, yeah, it, you know, and so like in my other graduate programs, I didn't really seek out a lot of friends because I, I am very much a lonely creature who likes to be alone. And then when I came to Mizzou and it, I found a wonderful support system, but I also realized that, um, that graduate program was actively recruiting people from minority and marginalized groups. And uh, I, as much as I can complain about the administration of any institution, that was something that was very, it felt good. Um, and having Becky there was a support system I didn't think I needed. Um, and then I found it and then I was like, oh, turns out like I, I really did need this. Um, and Becky and I have had some really candid conversations about identity and how we move through the world. Um, and even now, Becky, your project, right? Learning Mohegan. Um, I was telling Rebecca earlier that last week when I left your reading, like I immediately got back into my documents that I was using to try to help me learn Cherokee. I think we've got less than 2000 people now who speak Cherokee fluently, like it is, it's disappearing. Um, and I know the importance of that. And so seeing your journey with language and also understanding language and worldview, you know, from the Mohegan linguistic perspective, all of these things I, I need to have in my life now. Like it, it's about spiritual fulfillment and emotional fulfillment. Um, and I think that I'm also in a space where there doesn't, I haven't found a native community here where I work in Murray, Kentucky. And I'd emailed yeah, you know, who's in charge of student orgs? And I was like, hey, you know, is there X, Y, and Z? And the answer was like, no. Um, so I'm not the only creative writer, but I haven't yet met other indigenous faculty or students. Um, and so I, I know I'm gonna need to, to return to this community that was already established for me um, and seek out more communities where I can. But I feel like I digressed. I went off over here. Like, this is what happens with me. Rebecca knows, like, <laughs> when does this? Um, well, am I supposed to offer advice? Well, I think it was sort of packed in there because okay. it was like, if you don't have that community, 
to sort of foster the community that you ha that you do have and and um, hold on to that and keep that dear because you may not always have that in your new spaces. I don't know. That's what I was hearing. Yeah, you yeah. And, and also just like community building, right? Mm -hmm. Like that. That's something I'm trying to do at my new institution, and um, I'm participating in stuff like a I don't know a write up or uh, an article about me where I, I say like, hey y'all, like I'm queer, I'm two spirited, I'm disabled, right? Um, I'm Cherokee because I know there are people out there that need to find those systems. Mm -hmm. And I'm lucky that I'm in a spot where I feel like I can be vocal about it because a lot of people aren't in that spot um, or they don't feel like they can be in that spot. Um, and so it's scary to reach out, but I mean, that maybe that would be the advice, right? Is to like, keep your ear to the ground and be watching and be listening. And if you think there's someone that maybe could be part of a community that you would like to be in or form to try to foster those, those friendships and relationships. And also, I mean, for faculty and administrators, I think understanding that your indigenous students need that and yeah. need to, and if you can help them make connections like that in any way, it's very important to have. Yeah. Be brave and keep your ear to the ground. Mm -hmm. I love it. Thank you so much. We, we are at time. Um, I am so grateful to both of you for reading today, um, for the bravery of your, your comments and your work and the beauty of it. Um, and the just the interesting nature of it. I'm, I have all of these amazing images in my head that I know I'm going to take with me into the later afternoon where it is now dark here in <laughs> Western Massachusetts. Um, so thank you everyone for coming to listen in. Uh, we have a wonderful list of recommended writers in the chat and we got some excellent advice and we were nourished by wonderful words and inspiring friendship. So I hope that you all find those those places that mean something to you to write about and those people that sustain and nourish you as well. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. And um, Gwendolyn and Rebecca, if you want to stay on just for a minute so it's not so abrupt, <laughs> you're welcome, but I won't keep you forever. Um, thank you, everyone. <laughs>